Jason Vines is a legend in my business. When I got into automotive journalism almost 20 years ago, he was already a titan. Now, that's a weird way to describe a PR guy, but that's Vines. It's also hugely accurate for a man who helped compass the American car industry for years and who everyone knew would always tell the truth, even if it got him fired. Vines got his start at Chrysler in the late 1980s. He was their safety spokesperson at a time when faulty minivan tailgate latches were throwing children into traffic. He worked at a collapsing Nissan, and he became a vice president at Ford two weeks before the infamous Ford Firestone tire scandal lit off. 271 people died from tire blowouts on Ford Explorers, Congress investigated, people were crying in tire stores, and two 100-year-old companies were suddenly at each other's throats. Later, Vines and his CEO were fired after putting together yet another recall, trying to save more lives. Through it all, he kept his head, even as his personal life stretched thin. There's an old maxim that says we learn the most about somebody when they fall down. In this podcast series, we examine what happens when things go wrong in the world of cars, what we learn, how we use that knowledge to get better, and how getting back up helps make us who we are. I'm Sam Smith journalist and a club racer, and I love stories. Welcome to Driven to Fail. Okay, so let's recap for a second. You built one of the most well-known careers in the business by dealing with other people's screw-ups, right? You wrote a book about it, and that book uses the phrase, shit hit the fan, a dozen times. And each time the phrase fits because companies are on the verge of coming apart. And a lot of the way to keep things together came down to your office and your relationship with the guy at the top. Now, I've personally heard people in this business, I've been doing this 20 years, I've heard people from day one, I heard people call you difficult, a genius, ridiculous, profane, one of the best to ever do this job, right? A producer at 60 Minutes said you were crazy, and he said you were a master at what you do. But the one thing was, you always tried to shoot straight and tell the truth. What drew you to this kind of work? How'd you get into it? Uh, by accident, actually. I was a econ major, communication major in college. Uh, I went to graduate school. Uh, Chrysler hired me out of graduate school in labor economics. And somehow I found myself in employee communications because I was going there to help start the department at Chrysler. And then I got, uh, I became a speech writer for the new Jeep guy, Joe Cappy. And he liked me and he wanted to put me in marketing. And the two days before I was going to go into marketing for Jeep Eagle, Eagle, what a screw up. <laughs> um, YJ, Cherokee, Comanche. And now Premier. Legend says Jeeps always land on their feet. And Eagles, well, they got to fly. You can bet on it. <laughs> um, they fired the Eagle PR guy and said, can you do... PR instead of marketing, marketing, and I said, <laughs> I don't know what the difference is. I soon learned, but uh, I, I got to work with a lot of great PR people, Steve Harris, Tom Kowaleski. I learned to do product PR, uh, and I got reputation of being creative. I never thought I'd be a crisis PR manager, uh, which is like a funeral director, but it seemed like everywhere I went, uh, things turned to shit all the time. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I left Chrysler. I was moving up in the ranks. I was getting known. I go to Nissan North America as the VP. You know, it's nice when you're 38 years old to be a vice president of, a, uh, of an automotive company. But when I got there, I realized how bankrupt Nissan was. Um, but I was excited about our challenge. And I was proud of my work there. And then Ford Motor Company came looking after me, even though they hated me. Jack Nasser just hated my guts because. He, wait, whoa, 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 whoa! Why did he hate you? Why did you? How did you make Jack Nasser hate you without even knowing them? Because I I called Ford on their crap. Um, <laughs> they announced they were going to make a clean SUV. I go. I told Ken Zeno, who later worked for me. I go. I said. A clean SUV, does that mean that all SUVs are unclean? 
do you guys realize what you're doing to this industry? But when I interviewed with Jack, he goes, I want to keep my friends close and my enemies closer. So he hired me and Jack and I are the greatest of friends. So wait, so, so, so you, you mentioned that and the book, the book is great, right? Because the book goes from, you know, your career for the first 20 years was basically jumping from one burning building to another burning building to another burning building. And somebody hands you a cup of water and says, put out the fire, right? And every single one of those crises, whether it was, you know, Nissan showing up at Nissan, the place was nearly bankrupt and needing turnaround or coming out of struggling Chrysler or showing up at Ford. And two weeks later, the Firestone tire scandal kicks off. Every single one of those things came down to somebody somewhere just needing to own something, needing to own the truth or a screw up, right? I mean, what, why is it so, and you mentioned this, right? In the book, why is it so hard to tell the truth? Everybody, all of us, it's, it's in so many moments, especially in pressure. Well, that's, that's the saddest part of it all because we have in America the most unforgiving no, excuse me, the most forgiving society in all of the world. We all screw up. And if you just say, I screwed up, sorry, I'm moving on. People go, mm, okay. But when you try to hide it and and say you didn't do it, and then it finally comes out, you, you ruin your reputation totally. So it, it's kind of sad, but tell the truth. It's really simple. It's cleansing of the soul and it gets you out of the crap because, you know, it's hard to keep track of your lies. So that's what I kept telling people. And sometimes, you know, people would go, oh, my God, what is this guy saying? I didn't care. Uh, you know, I went home at night. I had dinner with my wife and my kids. I got up in the morning and tried to shampoo and blow dry my increasingly reducing hairline, but I could look in the mirror and say, you know what? You did your best yesterday and you told the truth. So your whole profession, right, is built around, you know, on one end of it, there are snake oil salesmen and spin doctors. And on the other end, there are people who stand up at podiums and rostrums and go, this is what happened. And then answer questions. Why does so much of the job end up when things go sideways, when stuff falls apart, people end up back trying to do anything other than explain what's going on. Well, this is, I, I'm glad you mentioned that term spin doctor. I just, I deplore it. Uh, <laughs> and I've, I've heard it in several organizations. Well, let's turn it over to the spin doctors. I'm going, what? I'm not going to spin for you. Shame on you for calling me a spin doctor. PR is a strategic tool of the company. And if you don't use it like that, you're going to screw up. But don't call me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to protect your lies. You know, so many times we go, we have a PR problem. No, <laughs> you screw it up. You have a policy issue problem or you have a product problem. Don't say it's a PR problem. Let's, let's tell the truth. Just lay it out there. And people, you know, one thing I learned uh, you know, we think, oh, my God, the company had to do a recall. Well, all the studies I've seen, if a company, an automotive company does a recall and fixes it, the customer is even happier because they know that if the vehicle breaks, it's going to get fixed. That's, that's a scary thing. Don't be afraid of screwing up. Move on. Admit your mistake and move on. And as I say, this is a wonderful society we live in. We appreciate people that are honest but unfortunately we're we're surrounded by dishonesty from the government to godell and the nfl and so forth you know just tell the truth everybody will give you a pass because we all screw up from time to time it's you you know we were talking earlier and you mentioned that it's it's this deeply american thing to to, to be okay with rebirth, right? And, and it, it probably goes back to the notion that, you know, we're a country founded by immigrants and people starting over and, and, and some, you know, grad school definition of that. But so many of the, you know, you worked with a bunch of different CEOs um, and, and they are giant names in the business, right? They're the people people remember. Um, Lee Iacocca and Bob Lutz and Bob Nardelli at Chrysler. Not always, you know, in the case of Nardelli, not always positively, but- Sorry, I just vomit, Bert. <laughs> But, but like Carlos Ghosn at, at Nissan, who, you know, who ended up in an instrument case and an international fugitive, 
Dieter Zetsche, who had the greatest mustache in the business and possibly the history of time, right? But all those people, I mean, like in the, the crises that you ended up in, all of them, the one thing I noticed, you know, reading your book and, and, and just doing research for this, one thing I noticed was that most of those people, maybe not in our deli, but most of those people got to a moment where it was required that they take responsibility for something and they did it. And, you know, especially in the case of, um, like in the case of, of Nasser, of Jack Nasser, you know, who ended up taking responsibility for the Firestone thing. And that, that ended up meaning that you two left the company, you were canned. But what, what did those people do right when things got hinky, right? When it was clear their fail or somebody else's fail had put the company on the brink. Well, again, it goes back to telling the truth. Uh, my first week at Ford, we had a, a, a gasket problem that had been milling around for like three months. And it was obvious when I got involved there, the, we were guilty. These were bad products. And Jack said, what do we do? I go, let's recall these. Real simple. And of course, we had so much fight back, but I went ahead. Did it, cost us millions of dollars. That first Friday night of my first week, he goes, thank you for the advice. We got out of it. We paid the price, which we should, because you have to take care of the consumer first. They buy your products. I, I saw the same thing with, with Dieter Zetcha every step of the way. If we had a problem, just before I got back to Chrysler, um, the Pacifica, they were they had launched it, but it got delayed by six months because Zetcha came in and said, "What's the safety rating on this?" It was only four stars. He goes, "We won't launch it until it's five stars," and and so both Zetcha and Nasser would listen not just to me, but to the truth, and that's what set the company free and let us go on and sell a lot of products and make billions of dollars as opposed to Nardelli who, who shunned, he thought PR was, he tried to put us under marketing, uh, a disaster. I mean, he didn't understand PR uh, and understand that it's a strategic tool. If you use it right, if you're honest and you're not, making excuses and that's the difference you can make excuses and your your crisis will last weeks months years as opposed to just saying hey we screwed up but we love you our customer and we're going to take care of you first when you put your customer first you win even though it costs you millions in the case of the firestone ford crisis it cost the company billions but they saved lives so one of the, the things that's always fascinated me about American business is that it, it's, there's this hard split, right? People are either, people either value the customer and value the customer's input, or they see them as a lesser class of human that they have to reluctantly serve. And, you know, Nardelli is interesting because at Chrysler, right? Because he shows up in the turnaround. He came from Home Depot. He was CEO of Home Depot with zero retail experience. He ends up being CEO of Chrysler with zero automotive experience. And, and kind of had this, you could almost see it in his face when he'd go on interviews or when he'd talk to the press. He had this loathing contempt for the work he was doing. Why, what is it about, about the C-suite class that, why do those guys get... I mean, the obvious thing is ego, right? But what is it that causes them to end up with a worldview where they're either are really concerned about the person they're serving, the person they're building something for, or they just think they're slime? Like, how, how is, why does that split happen? Well, Nardelli in particular, he disdained everybody at Chrysler. <laughs> um, here's the thing. You can be arrogant, but if you're smart, I'll accept that combo. But when you're arrogant and you're stupid, that's a bad combo. It's like John Wayne said, life is hard. It's harder when you're stupid. <laughs> so how do you go ahead. Go no, go ahead. How do you how do you 
paint a picture and it did not a name on it, but paint a picture of a CEO who is stupid and walks into walks into rakes all the time and fails. Right. Because we we have there's this there's this other thing in American business where we we look at, you know, people with certain titles or money and we automatically equate that with virtue and intelligence. Right. And the truth is that it doesn't take being smart to make a lot of money or to get to a C-suite. But what's what's the exact opposite of what somebody running a car company should be? Right. What what is that in a, in a couple of adjectives? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, be willing to learn all the way through your career, from the time you get out of college or high school, and you 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 get into a job. You have to always have the ability to learn. And if you think you've learned everything, then you're stupid. <laughs> okay, uh, that wasn't three words. I'm sorry, but that that's no, really what it is. And, and that's what I enjoyed working with, with, with Nasser and Zetcha and, and Carlos Ghosn. They were the smartest guys in the room. They didn't act like it because they were always willing to learn from other people and, and incorporate what they're learning from people. And, you know, it's the thing. Great leaders, uh, they shouldn't be the smartest person in the room. They should surround themselves with the smartest people. But if you go in thinking, I'm smarter than you, I'm going to shit on everything you've done in the past. That's that's no way to build a team. And that's a difference what I saw from from Nasser and Zetcha and Gon to the bottom feeder in our deli. And I have no problem taking a giant bull dump on him because... He was the worst leader I've ever worked with because he wasn't a leader. So, so the Ford Firestone, not to go backward for a second. But I like Fire... going backward. Let's go back to my childhood in Pella, Iowa. <laughs> Tell me about your mother. Sit on the couch. A hot dog is just a hot dog. <laughs> so the, the Ford Firestone thing, right? That's nuts. And, and I, you know, I was aware of it at the time and spent a lot of time paying attention to it. But some of the numbers are insane, right? So literally millions of tires recalled on, on a vehicle that you could not just up and buy millions of tires for, right? Uh, 271 deaths, you know, a massive blitz that took over the news for weeks. And you had these two century old brands, Firestone and Ford, both of which are tied like, all the way back, right? You know, Harvey Firestone and Henry Ford were pals. And, you know, the kind of these companies are interwoven both, you know, from a business side, business standpoint and a family standpoint for a century. And they all of a sudden are at each other's throats. And Firestone is trying to convince both Ford and the world that it's Ford's fault. And Ford's, you know, the way you tell it and the way most of the media tells it, actually looking at the data and trying to just figure out why people are dying. But it goes back to your whole, you know, your whole point that, you know, in a crisis, you come down to when things go, go, go ape, you figure out what the truth is and you state the truth and you move on. And what was it like when you were, when you were in that blitz, when it, nobody knew why this stuff was happening, when Firestone was trying to point finger back at the, at the motor company, did, was, was there some sense that, I mean, what did it feel like to be trying to chase a truth that, 300 different people had had their fingers in and and that the company didn't necessarily you knew that on some level like it might be the company's fault i mean because there was a point where you didn't know right did you like does, does that just feel awful or is it like no we're gonna figure it out well it, it it took over my life but early on um i'm very proud of this because i had the magic marker in my hand we're at an executive meeting with 12 of us we at this point we're meeting every day and Jack goes, we have to establish guiding principles. And those guiding, if I, I hope I can remember, the, I know the first one, the <laughs> safety and satisfaction of our customer is paramount, full stop. Two was we'll be open and honest with all of our communications. Three was we will only rely on facts and four, we'll spend 24-7 scouring the world for tires. No other decision would trump any of those. No financial decision, no legal decision. So we had what we believed was our core and, and, and just made it the reason we decided everything about it going forward. But interesting about... 
and I'm thinking two months into this, I get a call from uh, Lisa. I'm trying to think of her name and, I, and shame on her, shame on me because ABC, she goes, I have the smoking gun that proves it's your fault. And it was a tire test back in, I'm, we're talking 2000. It was a tire test back in 88, 89, when they were testing these Firestone tires. And you, I, I said, send me the document. And I look at it and I'm going, oh my God, we're guilty after all. Oh my God. And I walked down the, um, the aisle on the 11th floor of the, of the glass tower or glass house, as they called it before. I went into our, our tire room. We had established a tire room with suppliers, our supplier people and our engineers. And I handed it to Ernie Grush and I go, okay, asshole, here it is. He was back in my office 10 minutes later. He goes, you're missing a couple pages. And that was the two summary pages where they had not tested the tires that were eventually on the Explorer. It was a different tire. And I went and I went back to Lisa at ABC. I go, let me send you these two other pages. Cause of course we had all the documentation. She goes, Oh my God. I go, you can't trust your source. Of course the story was killed, which is the best part of what a PR person can really do when they can kill a, an erroneous story. Two days later, Joe White, a great friend of mine at the wall street journal calls. He goes, Jason, I have the smoking gun. I go, is it 25 pages long? He goes, how'd you know that? I go, let me send you the two final pages that you're missing. And he called me back. He goes, oh, my God, I almost got hoodwinked. I go, go back to that source and tell them they're liars. But that's what we were dealing with. We were dealing with liars all along the way. And some of those were supported by Firestone because they were on the brink of bankruptcy now again. So this, so just to recap here, this this report was Ford internal and a Ford internal test of tires. And it basically... But if it had been, if, if those two pages had not been omitted, it would have shown that Ford knew what the problem was years in advance, knew the tires were, were garbage, unfit, you know, pick your word. Yep, absolutely. And, and buried it. But that wasn't it, right? And that was that's one of the more interesting things about that whole period is there was so much back and forth between Ford and Firestone and people leaking things and, you know, stuff that got on 60 Minutes and the news that, that was, that was, so everybody was trying to take somebody else down and not take the fall for it. Did it feel that frantic? Because you read the history of it, and it's it's just like shots fired every five seconds. Well, we early on, we did not want a war. <laughs> and we did not want a war because we did not want to put our customers in the middle of a war between two 100-year-old companies. You know, you you mentioned that. Billy Ford, the chairman of Ford Motor Company now, his mom, her maiden name is Firestone. Yeah. I mean, that's how it was. But we we did not want to fight. The media wanted us to fight. Congress wanted us to fight. Our customers didn't. I had sent about three or four members of my Ford's PR staff down to Nashville to work with Bridgestone Firestone because it was the talk of the world about the tires. But after about a week, Mike Vaughn, may he rest in peace, a great guy, called me. He goes, we don't feel safe down here. <laughs> because they didn't the, feel safe at, in the Firestone offices? That's right. They didn't feel safe because the arrows were coming at them on my staff. Because Firestone realized they were, they were a caged rat trying to get out. So there was, there was a, a real recognizance on each side that some, like, Either one of these companies could burn for it, right? Possibly both. At the, at the yeah, and, and and after you know the first six months, it, the view was that Firestone's dead. They're dead on the ground, and the and the plaintiff's attorney said, "Okay, let's go where the money is. The money is Ford Motor Company, evil." <laughs> and so they turned their sights on us. But but going into the next year, into two thousand one, our engineering team was continuing to look at the tires, not the ones that were recalled, but looking at the other Firestone tires that were identical tires, but made in other plants saying, are they going to crash and burn too? And in May, if I get my numbers or months right, 
They came to the conclusion that the other Firestone tires built in the other plants, but the same design, were just a year behind disintegrating and killing people. God. And so I'm up in Jack and I, Jack Nasser and I up in his office. I don't know what day it was, but it was late at night. I should have been home with my wife and children. And he had gotten a report from Richard Perry Jones, the chief engineer. And the report said that because these tires were going to disintegrate this summer, because it was all based on heat, that uh, eight people would die. And, and Jack said, what do we do? I, I go, I, I know what we do. And he goes, we got to recall the other tires, don't we? And I go, yep. He goes, you know, we're both going to get fired for this. I go, I don't care. I don't care. And that's the proudest thing I am. That's the proudest thing in my career. Uh, nobody died that summer. And we would have known because the media was all over this. Right. If somebody had died of an Explorer rolling over because of tires, nobody died that summer of 20, 2001. I'm Imagine. very proud of that. And that's why I say in the book, these bastards at Ford Motor Company hired me, but they did the right thing to save their customer. Okay. You've mentioned a couple of times your family and it comes up in the book, but just the idea that you can, with any job you care about, right? I mean, hell, journalism, you can spend too much time sitting at the desk or just buried in the, the morass of, of, of trying to do the best job you feel needs to be done. Right. But the, the funny thing about your career, and this 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 hit me over and over again as I was going through the book, right? So you went from crisis to crisis, right? You went from struggling Chrysler to Nissan near bankrupt and turnaround to the Ford thing happening two weeks in, and then back to Chrysler. And the Ford thing happened as your dad was dying. How how do you keep your, I mean, there's no better word for it, but how do you keep your shit together when your job is to keep other people's shit together and they clearly aren't keeping your shit together and sometimes keeping their shit together keeps you from keeping your shit together? Like, how did you, how did you, was there a moment where you woke up and realized the balance was off? Well, now you're going to make me cry. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Um, I have a wonderful wife of 36 years. And there'd be times when I needed a hug. <laughs> and she would always say, honey, you don't need this anymore. But I said, no, I need to do it. Um, I have I have a family and I have my faith. And a lot of people don't care about the latter, but I do. Um, and kept me strong and knew that I was doing the right thing. Um, that's really... As Forrest Gump would say, that's all I got to say about that. There's, you, you come upon a couple of moments. And one of the things I like about what you, you know, you're writing is that you tend to pull it down to, I mean, I'm a big picture guy, right? The whole point of storytelling is to figure out what makes, what's going to make somebody else care about something and then zoom in on it. And, you know, there are a bunch of, bunch of kind of bullet points in the book talking about, how you deal with things going pear-shaped, you know, communicate honestly and openly, especially when things get weird. Um, keep your people informed, speak truth to power. Right. And, and one of them, the one that I, I kept coming back to was the, the phrase, don't isolate your support system. And, and, and it's, it's so funny because it is, you know, we talked earlier about Americanism, right? This idea that anything is forgivable and, you know, virtue lies in certain, certain reinventions. And yet one of the things we, we tend to bury is this notion that there is such a thing as working too much. And we are, we, we, we're just so, we're so taught and so incentivized to not pay attention to the people who help us. When that, when you jumped from job, not jumping, right? Because you spent you spent real careers at each job, but more, okay. more in the sense of jumping from crisis to crisis, right? Every time you change the job, something came up. You mentioned it at one point. It in Chrysler, you show up at Chrysler in the early two thousands. Three hundred had just come out. You know, Snoop Dogg emailed the company and asked how he could get one because he couldn't get one. And and that was a you know you basically had a year where nothing went wrong. Did that? 
did that make you uneasy? Did it feel like a, did, did it feel like something was always around the corner waiting to bite? I mean, no, no, I, I got to say, no, I, uh, 2004 and 2005 were the greatest years of my career in the automotive industry, but I'm going to go back to what you said. How do you, you, you keep grounded or at your support system, you know, at when, when I was rocking and rolling, I would come home and on Saturday morning, my wife would hand me uh, the Windex and the bubble scrubbles and a pail and and a couple of rags and go go clean the toilets hot shot <laughs> i mean they're dirty really yeah well, dirty. and it's fine clean. it's it's the greatest crisis i've ever been in because i could see it cleaned <laughs> up at the end <laughs> mostly because i had done most of the damage but um she was always there and is always there to ground me when i i Hopefully I didn't, you know, you said a lot of journalists think I'm combative, and um, maybe In some say I'm cocky. I meant that as a compliment. I no, it's fine. Yeah, and no. I hate you. Um, but it's fine. Um, I'm hateable, but that's not important right now. No, but um, just to make she always made sure that I was grounded because you know, I grew up a little kid in small town in Iowa and a middle class family, and and my wife did. She grew up in Pontiac, Michigan, and, and she just made sure that I didn't get ahead of my skis on who the hell I was. And that's kept me, you know, it's kind of grounded me always, but she was always there. Unfortunately, making me clean the shitter, but she was always there for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all of the executives you spent time with, right? And again, these are, these are giant names. I mean, the exception are not uh, but these are giant names and people known for being just insanely good at what they did. Did they, did they, all of them have recognizance of the need for that balance? Like what, when you're, when you're running Ford or Chrysler or whatever it is, do you, did those people take care of their home life or was that just in the background? Cause the cliche no, is that it's in the background. Oh, right? that's a great question because when I got it, I got it Ford. Okay. I'm vice president of Ford motor company. It's a big job. Yeah. I'm 40 years old, but all the other executives, most of them were late fifties, sixties. And we noticed when we, as I got to know them, that they all were in charge of the grandchildren. And, you know, I'm not trying to do a value judgment, but they weren't home. And that's why their kids were probably screwed up. And why they were they were taking care of the grandchildren. And I prided myself trying to be home always for dinner. Um, always being a part of my kids' baseball, softball, and so forth. But it's so funny, the night that I got fired with Jack Nasser, um, we had uh, a party, not a party, but a kind of a cry party at his condo across the street. And uh, I go after an hour there drinking a glass of wine that probably cost more than I made that year. Um, I went home. I pulled into the garage. I'm trying to think if I was driving a Land Rover or whatever, but whatever. And I get out of the car and my little girl, Lane, who's now 30, but she was nine. She opens the door. She goes, hi, Daddy. How was your day? I go, well, I got fired. And she looked at me and she goes, does that make you? Does that mean you can take me to school tomorrow morning? And I said, yeah, that's what it means. And it put that little episode, put everything in my life into, into perspective, everything from that little five second episode. Do most of the people, I mean, again, there's this American idea that if you're going to do things past a certain point, you have to be Elon Musk sleeping on the floor of the factory. You have to sacrifice everything. Do most of the people at that level try or do they just, at least the ones you've worked with, do, or do they just acknowledge and, and just say, screw it, this isn't it. I can't family. I have to, I have to company. I saw that most at Ford where it was just a obsession that you had to work all the time. Um, I didn't see it so much at, um, at Chrysler. I think Chrysler was much more, the, the population of executives was much more grounded. 
uh, with the home work balance. Uh, Nissan, I can't comment on that because, you know, I was only there less than two years, but I, I met some wonderful people there. And I, from what I see, the executives had a fairly good life, work, uh, home life balance, because you're in Southern California and want to go to the beach all the time. So I was going to uh, ask, I mean, the differences between the companies, was was that intentional or was that accidental? Um, I think it was accidental. Um, I was really um, against when I heard that Nissan was moving from L.A. to Nashville. I go, you're an idiot. You guys are idiots. Why do you want to take out this California vibe and move to Tennessee? I look back on it now. It was probably a pretty smart idea. But and, you know, Toyota's moved to Dallas. Um, but. You know, there's so many companies, and we see, remember, I was just thinking about the movie uh, Wall Street and that whole 80s thing, which I grew up in, where it was work, 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 and make money, and you don't care who you screw. Um, I think that almost it really ruined a lot of people's lives, and it certainly destroyed family lives. But in the but in the end, in the, in the Midwest, with the big three especially, I mean, these are wholesome families. And even though I, I point out that the Ford top level were just obsessed with working, generally, these are some of the greatest people in the world. And I will point out also, because I have to, that I was working with Dieter Zetcher when we were in charge of the United Way campaign for the southeast part of Michigan, which is primarily every year the number one charity giver in the country, because these are wholesome Midwest people, they believe in the Midwest work ethic, they believe in family, they believe in giving. And whenever I hear the term Rust Belt, I just want to smack people that say it because it's not. So, okay. So you grew up, you grew up in the Midwest, you mm -hmm. grew up in Iowa. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I, I found really interesting was that you really quickly and I, I, I don't know if this is common to Midwestern people. I'm from the South, but there is this thing where certain people make relationships in business pretty quickly. And you, you did that, right? So at, at Ford and at Nissan, you know, the people that you met, you tended to, especially CEOs, you tended to have very quick relationships with like Jack Nasser at Ford, you know, you'd known the guy four months and he flies to Iowa and shows up at your dad's funeral. I, I found that really interesting because that, the guy gets such a rap for so many things. You know, you told car and driver once he was the smartest guy you ever worked for. And yet the business, especially in the period, spent so much time on what the guy did wrong. And I realize that's part of it, right? You know, I mean, it goes back to the whole point of the show. Failure is more interesting than success. But why, why do we expect people in those jobs to be perfect? Why, why do we expect so much of them? In, in 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 unrealistic ways often well it's the way we treat celebrities it's so we we put, we look at anybody that gets to the top that they must be perfect <laughs> no they're really just like you and i hmm. maybe a little smarter but um when the big people fall we just kind of laugh and we say aha that person fell but I learned from one of the guys at, uh, at Chrysler that did market research and so forth, and this may sound weird to go into this route, but every almost every movie ever made in Hollywood is based on the Peter Pan theory. It is stated that Peter Pan despised adults, like had so much hatred for these adults. So much so that there was a saying that every time someone breathes in Neverland, an adult dies. Is we like the little guy, oh, excuse me, I have to, little guy or girl to be down here and they rise and they rise and then they get so high that they fall and we love them to fall, but then we want them to get up. And if you think about that, think about every movie you've watched. That's kind of the premise. It's called the Peter Pan theory. <laughs> but that's what America's about. But again, I go back to my premise before. We're a very forgiving country. We want people, 
everybody wants even the big shots to kind of look like us, that they can screw up, but we'll forget them. That's the greatest part of this country. Okay. So on that note, one of the other things I love about your arc is that you, you got into you got into politics. You mentioned this earlier. We were talking talking before the recording started, but one of the, the early bits of that was you worked with Cormac Kilpatrick, the Detroit mayor, who famously, um, well, let me back up. You worked with him a little and then a lot more, trying to tell him and, and coach him how not to screw up, right? And later he screwed up so badly that he went to jail for 28 <laughs> years. And I realized you only had a little bit of exposure to the guy, but when somebody is on track to just absolutely face plant as badly as they could possibly do it. Can you see that coming? Is there any kind of intuition with it? Or is it just, I mean, do some people just come out of nowhere and you're like, wow, didn't see that guy ended up in the, in the clink. No, that's what I, we talked about earlier. Um, that bad combination of arrogance and stupidity. <laughs> he had the arrogance. He had the ability to be really smart, but he got stupid. I mean, early on when I got back to Chrysler, you know, in that first, Quarter, Dieter Zetcher said, "Can you please help out Kwame Kilpatrick?" And so I, I went down to, I, I put a PR plan to him because he was his his administration was starting to implode because of the Navigator scandal and all this stuff. But it's, the problem was his staff was lying, so I put a PR plan together for him, and um, I met with him. I'd never met him before. I met him in his office, and I said here's what we need to do. And I was taking him through it and he started to take notes. I go, you don't need to take notes here. Here, just, you can have this. I made this for you. I said, here's the thing, Kwame. Um, actually, I said, Mr. Mayor, two things. Tell your staff to stop lying. And number two, never use a race card. Never. This city is sick of that. And of course, I'm not a I'm not a child of Detroit, but I'd been there since 1983. So I'd been there 20 years. I loved the city of Detroit. I still love the city of Detroit. Don't use the race card. Well, later when I'm at CompuWare and my boss, the CEO, is Kwame's best friend, is the last man defending him. I I, I met with Kwame. I said, you you got to come straight on this stuff. And he wouldn't. And, of course, he went to jail. Because he had, his arrogance and stupidity killed him in the end. That's a bad, as I said, it's a bad combo. Now, luckily for him, Trump got him out of jail. Did he deserve to be out of jail? Nope. Um, but he got out of jail. But he really did so much damage to the city of Detroit. And shame on him. And, I, you know, early from the time I first met him, he was my friend. I had to give up on that friendship, but I usually don't. But he and his team were such pathetic liars that they lost me, although <laughs> that's a hill of beans. What does that mean? <laughs> but uh, I actually left the company I was working with with an argument with the CEO because he kept supporting him. And I said, you can't support him anymore. He, he, he's guilty. I mean, he's beyond guilty. It was sad. It was sad to watch. I can imagine. So talking about things that you see coming, right? So that, that there's one inevitable follow-up to that. So Nissan, right? The turnaround in the 90s, you know, they bring in Carlos Ghosn because Renault has bought the company. Renault buys the thing at rock bottom prices. The company is, you know, bleeding ink <laughs> and comes in. And his nickname was Le Cost Killer, right? He comes in and does this like remarkable turnaround on the company and some Great products came out of that, right? The 350Z, handful of other things, the Xterra. Um, but some of that turnaround is is actually taught as you know the as what you do when you are reinflating a company that's been deflated. And yet, you know, a couple of years ago, the guy ends up becoming an international fugitive and fleeing Japan in. I, what was it? It was a cello case or something. You know, he, they it was something like that. It certainly wasn't a. It certainly wasn't a violin case. He's not <laughs> that little. But <laughs> <It's right. laughs> they smuggled the guy out of the country, and he still maintains his innocence. And there was, you know, there was a giant international scandal. And it it doesn't matter whether you believe he's innocent or guilty. It for the for this what I'm about to ask, but it's more just. <laughs> Did, did any of that, like the fact that that's attached to that guy is a stain on the dude's record forever. Of course it is. But did any of that in the 90s 
did do you i mean in the, in the kwame question do you, did you see that coming and i don't mean see it coming but does that fit the personality type well um i'm still a big supporter of carlos Ghosn. okay uh, i always remain so um he saved nissan nissan would not be around today without carlos Ghosn. uh was he arrogant of course uh, anybody at that level may have an ego it's a matter of how you keep it in check. But um, I think Japan uh, screwed up with him. Um, we I remember sitting in his office as we, we were drafting the Resound Revival Plan, and he said, the Japanese think they're getting this company back. They really thought they were going to get the company back. And not because of the takeover of Renault. And he goes, they're crazy. Because we're lucky if we save it. But it took them, you know, that was 1998, 1999. So it took them 15, 20, you know, 15 years to get the company back by making him a fugitive. <laughs> I would have done the same thing, although I probably would have got into a bass case instead of a <laughs> cello case. But I mean, it, it's a great story. I can't wait for the real movie to come out. Um, was he overpaid? Did he hide money? I don't care, really. Um, to be honest, considering he saved a major corp Japanese corporation, he, he got underpaid. Um, really, he did get underpaid. When you, when you look at the money and see what some people make in our world, um, being CEOs or shareholders or whatever. So I think it really was corruption on, on the Japanese government. Uh, they threw them in basically solitary confinement. I was amazed. This is like the Midnight Express, how they got him out. I just think it was freaking genius. And of course, I think he's in Lebanon yeah. and he's, he's under house arrest there. It's probably a really nice house to be arrested in <laughs> but i'm i will always remain a fan of his um it's funny you you mentioned his um his nickname i'm sitting in his office late at night in tokyo this is when we're coming up with the plan not i'm the pr guy i'm not coming up with the plan plan i'm going to communicate it and it, he goes jason can i change my nickname le cost killer <laughs> and i'm sitting there going yeah sure yeah. what do you want to be called stud and i'm thinking <laughs> Thank did i just did i just step on my schwanz and it took him a minute and he started laughing he goes i get it i get it <laughs> he later became um his nickname was 7-eleven because you can't Wait, what, give your really why yeah you can't give yourself a nickname <laughs> that's what i told him i said what do you want to be called stud and then when he started laughing, I go, you don't give yourself a nickname. Why are you People, called 7-Eleven? Because he worked, the Japanese realized he was working from 7 to 11 to save the company. And he became a comic book hero. Seriously, they made comic books about it. I didn't know that. Oh, it's, it was amazing. <laughs> I mean, seriously, he <laughs> saved the company. He saved tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. No, no, hundreds of thousands of jobs. In Japan and in the United States, he saved the company almost so, single-handedly. So, so much of that had to do with you know Japanese business practices and how the Japanese view. You know, it's, they're a very proud group of people in a in a corporate environment, right? And things tend to be very rigid in how things are created and how how they are disposed of and how bad ideas are. You know, the doors are closed to them. But so much of what he did was was kind of undoing the structure of the place. Why, what was it about the way the Japanese had built that company that veered into, because I mean, like if, if you, I mean, I'm talking about failure, right? If you're bringing a company to, you know, a, nothing but a pile of red ink and a deflating balloon, that, that's a giant fail. What was it about the arrogance that, or maybe it was an arrogance that built the company in the way it did that caused that to happen? Well, it was a protected industry, uh, not just with Nissan, but all the Japanese companies through the Koretsu system, these um, interconnected companies that were charging too much and so forth. And and he went in saying, I have to break the Koretsu system for this company or they won't survive. We have too many plants. We have to close some. And of course, it was lifetime employment in Japan. 
So the night before the announcement of the re- Nissan revival plan, and I think we were closing four plants, which was blasphemy. We were meeting with the PR staff. I'm there as an American with my friend, Dan, uh, the Brit. And, we're, and Carlos is talking to the junior, the, the PR, the Japanese PR staff. He goes, here's what we're going to do. If this leaks out tonight, I won't close floor, four plants. I'll close five. But he did it, and of course, um, he was just almost burned at the stake, figuratively, for doing that. However, that night, well, I was again in his office, way late, and he goes, "What, what, um, what headline do you want tomorrow?" I go, "I said we're changing Japan Inc. That's what I want." So the next day, we have this huge announcement. I've more media than I've ever seen that wasn't at an auto show. This was a press conference. More cameras than I've ever seen. And the next day, the headlines were Changing Japan Inc. Uh, I just <laughs> felt so damn good about myself. <laughs> but he changed it. He saved the company. And then he became a hero. And then for for the Japanese, for Nissan, for Japanese Nissan, the headquarters and working with the Japanese government to make this guy a criminal to me is just the most insane thing I've ever seen in my life. Just the most insane thing. What do you, what do you think it's rooted in? Why? I mean, obviously it was a, there, I mean, was it some element of pride having had somebody else fix it? Their company was stolen from them. Yeah. Much like that, that early before the plan came out, he said, they think they're going to get this company back. We're just trying to save them. And so once they got fat and sassy again, they said, okay, now's the time. We can take our company back. Well, sorry, somebody else gave you a lifeboat. You don't want to, you don't want to shoot him in the back of the head for that. But that's what they tried to do to him. And of course, then he said, I have to get out of this country in a cello case. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the, you know, totally the most obvious answer. I mean, I, should I need to leave this room in 20 minutes? I'm leaving in a joke. <laughs> Why not? But so not to totally change tax here, but one of the, the things that got me thinking about is how we were just wired in so many cases to look for easy answers when things go, go wrong, right? You know, the easy answer with going, leaving the country as fugitive is, oh, well, he was, he's obviously guilty. He's, of course, the easy answer with Nissan coming apart is, well, they made bad cars and they managed it badly, right? And th- those things are not, like, the, the, the reality is so much more than that. And, the, you know, you, you presided over a, you presided over the, hell, the, the Jeep unintended acceleration scandal, not scandal, but with the Cherokee and Grand Cherokee yep. in the 90s, right? And the Chrysler thing where minivan lift gates were coming off and children were being ejected in high speed accidents. And these, you know, these, both of those moments were presented, uh, you know, if were presented to the media or were in, inhaled by the public a certain way, but the truth of what actually happened is very different. And, you know, it, it, it carried on, right. It was repeated in the, you know, the Toyota floor mat unintended acceleration thing and everything else. But why are we so wired to look for easy answers with this stuff. I mean, is it just because we like tidy endings? What? I don't know what you mean by easy answers, because when you talk about all those, those crises that, that happen, you got to realize that there's a, there's a, a whole cottage industry of plaintiff's attorneys <laughs> that are searching for billions of dollars. And you as a company may not be guilty of anything but they want to prove you are so they can get lots of money. And as I point out in the book, the Chevy Volt, the whole fire with the Chevy Volt was such a fraud by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Such a fraud. But now they love to see now on when Tesla, you see a Tesla that's burning and it's going to burn for five or six more years in the, in the lot. They want the plaintiff's attorneys, which are, I believe, are the scum of the earth, want to just get billions, not for their for their plaintiffs. They want to get it for themselves. And they make they they try to make it worse. However, having said that, the company needs to take care of their customer first. So if you just take care of your customer, 
you can say F you to the plaintiff's attorney. They're still going to sue you. But always it doesn't matter that these plaintiff's attorneys are out there shaking the bushes. Take care of your customer. At least do that. Put that aside for now. They're going to be there. and They're always going to be there. Put your customer first always. And that was my problem with the Chrysler minivan launch. We, we, there was no smoking gun there. However, there was a little bit of, eh, we should have done a little better, but there was no smoking gun. I, I told my brother-in-law in charge of the minivan, let's just take the government out of this, the plaintiff's attorneys, let's just take care of our customer. And that's what you, if you do that, and it's not just the auto industry, if you do that in any business, I'm going to take care of the customer. Now, and it's funny because in PR, the greatest PR story of doing it right is the Tylenol back in Chicago. <laughs> that is so overplayed. They had the scandal, the crisis. They balked at first. And then when it got worse, they reacted. It was so easy for Tylenol to handle this. They, just just I'm so using, people know, this is the this is this child safety kit, the thing that produced the child safety. Before, before oh, the cap. Oh, oh this really? is this is what created the cap. So but it produced, some, this produced it, right? Some psychopath had put some poison into Tylenol capsules in like three or four bottles. And in the Chicago, I believe it was Chicago area. Well, Tylenol at first said, bah, no worry, no worry. And then when it got worse, when like, don't quote me on the number, seven, eight people died. They realized it was a crisis. So what did Tylenol do? Well, they're the masters now. Suddenly, they're the masters of the, of the crisis. And, but it was so easy. You know, it's not easy telling people to bring their vehicle back because people go, oh, I need my vehicle. I have to take my kids to school. I got to get to work. Uh, I'll go in three weeks and take my vehicle back. But for Tylenol, it was just a directive to all retailers, grab a box, go to the aisle where the Tylenol is, scoop it off, send it back to us. We'll pay for it. That's pretty easy. It, it, they weren't telling people that had Tylenol, hey, you have to bring your Tylenol. No, just go to the retailers, and it was over. But it's considered the, the benchmark of crisis management. Bullshit. <laughs> You know, Actually, in a, is it true they teach that in in school? Oh, oh like, my God! It's oh, oh, of course. Let's really? uh, let's talk about crisis management. Of course, the bellwether <laughs> case is the Tylenol, Bullshit. which is which is entirely different from like the Ford Firestone thing, right? Yeah, Where people were literally crying in tire stores because they couldn't get tires and they were worried about their families and yes. millions of dollars. I mean, it's it's nuts. Yeah, you but, tell somebody, hey, you've got a brake issue, right? Um, please bring it in immediately, honey. Uh, we got this recall like three months ago. Are you going to bring the vehicle in to get it, the brakes fixed? <laughs> yeah, I, I will. But God, get away, get off my ass, honey. <laughs> I'm working. <laughs> it's it's a totally different industry, but it it just frosts my ass when they when they when so many schools use that as the 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 bellwether of crisis communication. It's not because they screwed up at first, but now they look like now they look like experts. I guess I guess what I meant going back a second. I guess what I meant by easy answers was not not the companies or legal structures or PR people, right? But like the public's desire to 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 connect the simple dots in a simple story. And you see it in everything from conspiracy theories to you know movie plots, right? You know we we want to pull things down to a the A leads to B leads to C, and life just isn't that simple. Well, we, right? we want those quick answers. We're a very disposable society. We like everything yeah. that we can use and throw it away. But especially today in um, 2022, we have such a divided country that we get our news sources from two different places. And they're trying to, you know, you're going to get, if you hear a story about a company or, or a politician or whatever, you believe this side, and, but if you believe the other, you'll you'll get news source from here, and so that uh, the consumer today is just totally confused if they're paying attention to both sides. So it there, yes, we we as a society want point A to point B is make it as quick as possible. Um, but Sorry. unfortunately, we're not getting that because there's so many desperate or disparate or whatever the word is views on what is real and what is it. We don't know what's true anymore, which is kind of sad. 
how so right so so if the whole point of of pr and just communicating with the public about anything comes down to telling the truth and being being just straightforward about how things work how is i know you're no longer in the car business but you're still in in, in your business and a lot of a lot of what you do revolves around public facing concepts like how how has that business changed over the past 10 years with you know the changing meaning of truth uh, as, well, as crazy as it sounds right um they're both going down the rat hole <laughs> <laughs> how do you think can you fix it how do you fix it uh, uh, well uh, uh as you know well i do surveys with my teams and so forth media trustworthiness is at its lowest point in history yeah um unfortunately pr is at its low in my opinion lowest point in history too because Why? they're not truth they're not truth tellers um they're they are remember we talked about this earlier they are spin doctors and that's that saddens me it really does we've just gone down we are in my life i can't talk about the history of america or the world although i've been around 140 years no you look it too yeah thank you thank you're you. welcome <laughs> we Sorry, are at the, go on. we no we are at the lowest point in trustworthiness of information in my life which how is you, sad how do you i mean if you can wave a magic wand and do one thing how do you try and undo that because we don't you know we don't we don't trust each other we don't trust our neighbors we don't trust the other side of the, the aisle you know nothing and that's and it, it's not like the 90s or the 80s were some golden time where you know everybody was in love with each other but it came down to the number of the number of megaphones the number of places people got information and you can't undo the internet how do you what would you do to fix it if you could do one thing it, is there uh, no there is not one thing um See, I'll, I'll reveal my politics. I'm a conservative. I hope that conservatives take control of the government soon. Is that going to fix it? No. Right. Far from it. Nor would it fix it if the other side got it. I mean, it's no, not, it's, it's, it's not. I, 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 if I had the answer, um, I would be charging a lot of money an hour. But <laughs> there, I don't know. There's, I, I think there needs to be a, a reawakening of our society right now. And I'm sounding like I've been smoking weed, but I haven't. Well, not a lot. No, no, I haven't been smoking any weed. Um, but I'm not sure. I, I wish I had answers, but we it all goes back to telling the truth. And we are in perilous times. I don't want to scare anybody although nobody's going to go oh my god jason vine said we're in perilous times <laughs> i want to jump in a river but we're in perilous times right now and i don't know what a shake-up is i don't know how you, you can get out of this because i wouldn't i hate the term death spiral because we're not in a death spiral because the vast majority let's talk about this country the vast majority of americans are really good people uh, and as I work in politics, he used to say, you know, on the left side, there's 10% crazy. And on the right, there's 10% crazy. And in the middle, there are 80% people that really have the same values. It's, it's not that way anymore. It's almost 50-50 complete split. And that, that's the scariest part of our country right now. Sorry, I hope I didn't depress everybody that, that will watch this. Oh, I'm I'm on it. I'm on a shit ton of pod right now. I'm not depressed at all. Um, <laughs> it's uh, God. What am I? A senior citizen? Who who's on pot? God, nobody says I'm on pot. Um, <laughs> but no. Okay, so so one of the one of the things we're we're about out of time. But one of the things we tend to wrap this show up with is one question, and we've talked a lot about this over the course of the past hour or so. But what's when you fail at something, you, Jason Vines, what's the first thing you do once you've realized that you failed at it? You admit you failed. <laughs> you don't try to talk your way out of it or talk your family or friends out of it. You just say, I screwed up. And I promise to do better. But if you spend your time saying, oh, I really didn't screw up, I, uh, then it's just, it's, it's, it's your personal life, just like in business. 
if you can't admit you made a mistake, then then you're going to fail again and again and again. And the, luckily, I have a 36 year wife who reminds me every day that I fail. <laughs> but then <laughs> she always picks me up too. But the fact is, when you get so ahead of yourself and so your head so blown up that you think, even when you screw up, ah, I'm Superman, I'm Superwoman. No. When you fail, um, learn from it. That's the beauty of things about life. You screw up here. It's like when you're planting grass. Oh, damn it. I planted the wrong grass. Admit, you screw it up. You redo your back lawn. You put the right seed down. But admit, you screw it up. And you move on. And I, I'm only using this grass thing because... I live out in Arizona now, and I'm such a stud. I thought I'd be the only person in our new subdivision that could actually grow grass because I'm an Iowa boy, and I believe in natural products. Sure. Yeah, it's you. I'm not going to. That that fake shit? No, not for me. I'm Jason (laughs) Bud's from Iowa. Our house was two and a half years old. Our lawn is huge. It's 15 feet deep by 50 feet wide. (laughs) You can mow it in 14 seconds. Um, I have spent until a month ago when I actually gave up and planted and put fake grass down. I think I spent more money than if I just would have put the fake grass in it at the first time (laughs) on fertilizer, on water, on shooting birds and yes i shot birds who were eating my seed i with an ar-15 by the way <laughs> why, um, why 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 grass man why do you live in the desert why did you need it so bad <laughs> because i'm i'm stupid see arrogant and stupid right right, right. oh i can do that i'm here to save the day i can do this oh geez louise just it's been a disaster and so I ended up spending what I could have spent two and a half years ago to put the fake crap down. <laughs> and now when it's raining and my dog goes out, Sammy, the wonder dog, goes out in the rain and pees, I, he doesn't have mud on his paws. He just has a little water. If I would have known that, see, if I wouldn't have been arrogant and stupid, <laughs> I would have known that from the start. Well, on that note, that's uh, that's about it for us. Jason, <laughs> thanks for the time. And uh, thank you for the detailed habits of your dog's urination schedule <laughs> and uh, everything else. It's been a pleasure. Man. Thanks, Sam. <laughs>